and uh, away we go. Hello, everyone. Um, as I appreciate Scott's intro, um, just so you know, my licensure type, my background is I am a licensed mental health specialist, supervisor. I am a CSAT that's certified sex addiction therapist, supervisor. Um, I work with trauma as, as well as grief and loss and couples, families, individuals. Um, it's seeking integrity. It's individual processing and betrayed spouses or partners. So um, I, I found my niche many, many years ago in understanding sex, love, and relationship issues and how devastating it can be. So tonight, one of the things I wanted to talk about is just to throw out there, a lot of times we hear the terms cross addiction, and it sounds like a scary kind of word because it, it can be. One of the things to know is I'll give you some examples of what I see and then also define some of those things. Um, a cross addiction does not mean a dual addiction. So if I'm at a treatment center and somebody comes in and they have alcohol or drug issues or they have multiple addictions that are going on, they're going to be treated because they're doing it at the very same time. Talk about cross addictions, they can occur after somebody has been treated for, say I've been drinking, I've got a treatment, I get clean, I've got sobriety going, and all of a sudden another addiction creeps in. Now, um, I unfortunately have been in situations like that in my lifetime, which is means I'm human. Uh, but the scary part is it takes you by surprise. A lot of times people don't realize that they've stepped into another addictive process. So a couple of the things I want to go through is what we typically see um, at Seeking Integrity or any program that I've been in is the major addictions are the substance abuse, alcohol, drugs, sex, love, relationship, gambling, internet, which could be internet constant um, access to it, which is disturbing to your work, to your day, to your family, because you isolate. Under that, you may be working um, issues, you may be looking at porn. So anything can, can occur on the internet, as you're all aware. Sometimes I get lost in it because I'm so interested in learning something, and I'll look up and it's three hours later. And that's only on a Friday night when I don't have to work or don't have to worry about anything the next day. So I try to pace myself with that. Um, but again, the cross addiction is not the same as dual or multiple addictions. It's usually with dual or multiples, two addictions are present at the same time. And with cross addiction, it may be right after somebody's out of treatment or been treated for something. It could be years later that they fall into it. I see a lot of times people that are male or female, it doesn't matter, just human beings that are treated for something or helped with something. And it's a month later, two months later, a year later, there's a call that comes back and says, someone told me I have an eating disorder. I'm not eating, I'm anorexic, I'm binging. Um, don't really know what binging is because, you know, what, was it, what did it look like before? Or I'm, I'm purging. And I think the bottom line that everyone has to come to is my belief, and this is mine, okay, just where I come from, is what I try to work with, and I know what we do at Seeking Integrity, is not just work with the sex addiction or sex love relationship addiction, but we want to look inside. I want to know, you know what gets you to treatment. You know what gets you to a therapist for support or help or to a 12-step meeting. But the understanding of how did I get here? What happened along the way that all of a sudden this thing took over and I've lost control of my life, I've caused problems within my family, I've isolated. What is this thing? I refer to it as a disturbance inside. I'm not comfortable. I want to run. Um, it's not necessarily anxiety. It may be a situation in which I'm triggered because Scott's sitting there, and he triggers me. Not true, but he's good to use. Anyway, but in triggering me, it may bring up something from my past. It may be childhood issues, abandonment, neglect, sexual abuse. Um, it could be that I see a lot of times people that were adopted, 
and they not they don't really know who they are or where they come from so they always feel detached so we do call it attachment disorder as well it could be that um, something occurs in junior high I'm bullied I'm called names anything that makes me feel not enough and you can always fill in the, the end of not enough I'm not pretty enough I'm not sexy enough I'm not smart enough, I'm, I'm not friendly enough, fill in any enough. And I think everyone can touch base with something inside where we don't feel like we are enough or we deserve something. And so we look at childhood, adolescent, adulthood to look at any type of traumas that have occurred. And that can mean, again, neglect, abandonment, any of those kind of issues, not just a car wreck or a death, it can be any of those little T traumas that we talk about and combined together. I can't stand to live within me. So I must reach out for something that helps bring me down. It helps me feel like I can stay within my skin. But really what I'm doing is medicating and escaping. Sometimes it turns into a dual life because I can't do that at home. I have to go somewhere else to act out in whatever pattern of behavior that I have always around it is shame and guilt and shame and guilt piles up guilt piles up and up and up which usually we see addictions or addictive patterns of behavior grow i may do some work around that and the next thing i know is whoa i'm into gambling that would be i won the lottery first and then i'm gambling just to make sure everybody knows that part of it but um something's wrong it's a disturbance within me it doesn't mean I am bad. It means that something is not okay within me as Karen. And I am judging myself. I, am, I feel shameful of things. And I reach out for some way to escape, some way to run. And the only way to really work with that is to make sure that you're working with the therapist, you're working with a group of people that may support that type us that's going on ask for help it's about asking for support just like we do with any other addiction um it's again i think a really important piece is that it doesn't have to occur immediately it can sneak up on you i had a woman that um was in recovery from an addiction for 28 years i mean full on she was grandma of the group there was no question and there was a death in her family that was very close to her heart. So everything I'm talking about are these heart issues, these things that have hurt us in some way, and we don't know how to cope with it or deal with it or we're not ready to, but it's our heart. It's not our head. Our head says, thought, take an action. The goal is to go from your head to your heart to make the decision of what is right for you in the moment. And, and we all need help. At some point in time, we all need help in some way with that. Do you agree, Scott? That's interesting. <laughs> yeah, I was muted. Um, yeah, I do. I, you know, the, the, it's, it's the stuff inside until we get help with the stuff inside that drives the addiction. The addiction, mm -hmm. it's going to manifest one way or another. Mm -hmm. um, and that's certainly my experience as, as an, an addict mm -hmm. um, and even well into recovery. Is, right. Is. I love to surprise Scott and just go, okay, Scott, how are you doing over there? So anyway, because because we obviously can, can we know we're both sitting here. For families um, or support loved ones or things like that, and and you you may be completely frustrated with, I've been down this road before, I thought everything was okay. And maybe trust is being built back. Maybe you're starting to breathe a little bit knowing, okay, something is really different and it's great. I don't see him or her drinking or drugging anymore. And then that surprise can come back up and it and manifests itself in a very different way. That's why I always tell people, go to the heart. What is hurting you there? What is the secret that you've had to stuff in. Um, as a child, what we learn is how to escape it, how to ignore it, how to live with it. 
So if there's abuse going on, am I going to go and tell somebody? Mm, not at my age. Back then, you didn't tell anybody. But I stuffed it in. I kept quiet. I participated in the family. But I never said anything that had happened. And then I'm an adult. I'm grown up. I'm supposed to be able to handle this. I've got my head on. I'm working. I'm doing okay. I'm a therapist. And that piece comes back up again and again until I can't stuff it in. A lot of times when I'm seeing people that are in, say, their 40s, you know, it's, it's very common that I'll see a lot of people around that age. I describe it physically because I'm a very visual type person. Is It's like their addiction, their, their trauma, I'm sorry, is growing and growing and it's up to here. And I can't hold it in anymore. So I have to keep putting something in there, doing another addictive pattern of behavior so that I can forget it for a while, so that I can rest. Workaholism, very same thing. Now, I'm not saying people don't have to work and sometimes they have to work extra, but when you're escaping your thoughts, when you're escaping some issue at home or things like that, then you need to ask for help so that you can have a balanced life and you can get the secrets out. So to the loved ones, our people that are dealing with this, is please understand, it's about being honest and being open and trusting, maybe just a little bit, just a little bit, to take that step in and say, I'm not sure what's wrong, but something is happening inside of me and it's showing up like this or this. And you wanna catch it as quick as you can. People are not gonna be judging there's 12-step type programs for everything. There's support groups within therapist offices for everything. There's intensives that are going on. We have webinars all the time to explain any of these things that you can look up and understand. But uh, I really want to put out there, it's not about shame and guilt. It's about how do I discern what's happening. I'll, I'll add one more that shows up a lot is shoplifting. And many times what I see is, I may be able to afford something, you know, to go to a store and afford something that costs $2. But someone can walk in and they're already prepped. They're, they're a shoplifter. People don't know that. But they may just look for something that costs $2 just for the intensity of taking that and seeing if they can get out of the door with it. And it doesn't make sense. Yeah, they get busted. They get arrested. And then their life is all stirred up again. But there's something inside that said, I needed to give myself something or I needed to increase intensity for a few moments so that I could escape what the chaos is that's going on in my mind. So hopefully that's helpful and starts some questions coming in or just comments that you have um, about what you think and what I'm just sharing what I've seen throughout my career. Thank you, Karen. We, we've got a couple questions already. For those who joined us late, um, our topic today is um, cross addictions, sex, secondary addictions. Um, you know how we we have you know we have one addiction. We probably have several. Um, and and um, Karen made the point that they're all kind of driven by the same underlying issues, and, and we mm -hmm. will have to get at those, or or addiction will keep popping up in one form or another. So if you have questions about that or anything else, please pop them in the Q&A feature. Um, we've got some questions, but I want to ask Karen one before we get started. Um, sure. I came into treatment um, first for sex addiction, um, uh -huh. and later I got into recovery for alcohol and drug addiction. Um, even mm -hmm. though, uh, while I was active in my sex addiction, I, I would bounce from one to the other. I wasn't right. still occurring. I wasn't doing them at the same time. I wasn't a chemsex person. Uh -huh. I would feel bad about one, so I would get drunk, and then I would feel bad about exactly. drunk, and I would get high, and I would feel bad about that, so I'd go through the sex thing. Mm -hmm. um, do you recommend addressing all of the addictions at once, or trying to take them piecemeal, one at a time, from a treatment perspective? Um, I always say, what is the closest alligator to the boat? What is the one that is most present in your life? If my primary addiction today may be um, taking pain pills, numbs you out, makes you feel happy, makes you tired, allows you to escape. So if that is the, the biggest 
are the closest alligator that is going to take my life apart, then that's what I want to address first. That's why we ask when somebody calls and talks in an office or in a treatment facility is what is your presenting issues? And usually they'll present, this is what has just happened. This is where my family is concerned. Then we'll go down the line of any other things that, that you've been doing recently or within the last six months to fill in the blank. Just like you said, Scott, is while I'm working on sex addiction, um, if, if I'm going to my meetings and I'm doing things, it still doesn't necessarily take all the shame away. And if I'm not talking about that and doing it, then I may need to have a drink at nighttime. And that drink may be a fifth, whatever it is. And therefore I have something else and it's keeping me okay. I show up okay, but now I have another addiction. Um, always remember the eating disorders are very important. Those are, vi they're a process addiction, just like sex addiction is. They're very easy to hide. We have to have food. We have to have people. So, um, but I will say that once, once we know um, a client better and really know their history, then we may merge the, the idea of addiction together and just keep identifying the different patterns in which people act out and why they jump from this one to this one. Uh, a common term that's used always in therapy is it's whack-a-mole. It's sort of that game where whatever pops up, you hit it and another thing pops up. So we have to address them all, but it's what's most present. What is causing the biggest disturbance in your life? It needs to be addressed quickly um, so that it doesn't escalate again. Thank you. I think that's mm -hmm. a very good answer. Um, okay, let's let's get to the questions here. Um, the first one here, um, I just had a relapse after one month of my sex porn recovery. I'm sorry to hear that. You're doing well, I know. Um, I felt really shameful in the day, and I've been acting out since then. <clears throat> I wanted to stop, but my shame spiral took me back to my addiction. Um, I would really appreciate any advice at the moment. Uh, Karen, thoughts? That is... That is a story, and, and I really appreciate whoever's asking that question, that you've asked it and put it out there. That's the first step um, into getting help of some type is to admit it. And if you have been in recovery, like you said, a month or whatever, then you started to see the glimmer of what recovery can be, that hope, that place of my life can be different, and then you slip, you act out, and I can never raise my head up again. I cannot believe that I made these promises and that I worked hard and I'm trying to prove that I can stay in recovery and feel better and have a life, and now I'm staying in my shame pit. Well, we all have a shame pit. It's there. It's there from beginning on. I think we're born with it. maybe other shame. It may be our own. I encourage you to understand it means getting back up again. It means putting your hand out and having somebody back up so that you don't have to stay in that pit of shame. That will just keep you in the cycle of addiction. As a matter of fact, once the trigger starts, the acting out occurs, and the aftermath is usually shame, guilt, could be depression, anxiety, and then it takes us right back into the addiction again. So it can also be a trigger to start that addiction to have it increase. So I really encourage you to, to seek out and, and seek support around that. Yeah, the last stage of the addictive cycle is also the first stage of the addictive cycle. It's, it's right. emotional triggers. I feel shame. I feel lonely. Mm -hmm. I feel worthless. I feel not enough. Um, right. That's where we end up at the end of the cycle, and it also just spins us right back into it. Um, exactly. You know, Sex addiction is, um, at times, it's progress, not perfection. I mean, mm -hmm. obviously, we'd all love to do it perfectly. Um, but in early recovery with sex and porn addicts, relapse is fairly common. Um, and going into a shame spiral, it, in my experience, is fairly common. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, getting out of a shame spiral is tough. Um, you know, somebody told me once in early recovery, when you're walking through hell, don't stop. Yeah. Don't stop and enjoy the view. Keep walking. Um, 
so you know you you know it's there's a, a million cliches it's not how many times you fall down it's how many times you get up um and you know this is one where you know dissect it i don't know if you have a sponsor um, or a therapist i hope you do um if you do um dissect it you know and start before uh the relapse um yeah. start with the feelings that you didn't want to feel and go from there mm -hmm. scott to that um i'm going to quote dr rob on this because he taught me this way long time ago is tell the truth and tell it faster so don't linger in the place of you know, I've had a slip or a relapse or whatever it is. Tell the truth and tell it faster so that you can get up and keep walking. There is, you're, you're walking, you're still ahead. You're still walking down that path toward recovery. It doesn't mean you've dropped back into where you started. It just needs you need, means you need some more support around something that triggered it. Yeah. It's uh, relapses, slips and relapses are learning experiences. Um, and yes. I had to look at them that way to keep myself from, you know, taking a hammer to the side of my mm -hmm. head, you know. So yeah, hang in there, keep coming back. Um, right. You're doing well, and, and you'll, you'll, you'll get back on the horse. I know you will. Right. Remember, you're worth it. You deserve it. You deserve recovery. So it's, it's not easy to do it. I don't think anyone's ever told me they had an easy time going through it, but you deserve it and you're worth it. And that's what you need to believe in. That will help the most. Yeah. Okay. Um, next question here. Um, I would like to know how a partner in recovery. So we've got, I think we have a sex addicted partner in recovery um, who's done the sex fast. Um, he's been abstinent usually for 30, 60 or 90 days, probably as part of treatment mm -hmm. um, or early recovery. Um, how do they then um, turn the sex life back on again in a healthy way with their uh, betrayed partner? Um, so, you know, how does it, how does a couple when one of them is a sex addict and in recovery has been absent? They've both been absent, it probably because the sex addict. Right. How do they reintegrate um, a, a sexual life? What I always hope is. Um everybody's the sexual acting out can can be in very many different ways and hopefully if they've been working with a therapist then in their early recovery there's um uh, time frames that you give for different things if you're a betrayed spouse or partner then it can be extremely scary of i'm not ready i don't know if if i want this person to touch me or be sexual with me again and if that person is getting support and help and support for meetings and things like that is that's where I encourage both people to be working with a couples counselor so that they can start discussing how do they feel? The second piece is sexually, how were you before? Were you ever talking about something that bothers you or something that, that you need to come out with so that your partner knows you can be married for 30 years and never discuss I really don't like this part. I really want more attention. I want this. I want that. That's what I need to have in our relationship. And so I really encourage couples therapy um, or couples groups where you can start learning how to communicate with one another. And you both have to be ready. So it's almost like asking permission to, if you are the addict and you're in recovery, it's asking permission from the betrayed spouse or partner you know, where they are, not just to try to move forward with it, but it's like asking permission. Where are you on this? How do you feel about it? And really get that feedback and listen to it because it may take longer. And the, what I always say is they're still with you. They believe you. They're just watching for the signs to make sure that you're staying in recovery. And they have a lot of fear and trauma that they started working on afterwards. And that still may be going on. So I really encourage um, couples type process programs. Um, there's a lot of 12 step programs together that are out there or um, working with a couples therapist, but being honest completely. Communication is really, really a big deal. Um, I started a couples program with another gentleman at Seeking Integrity. And I think that is what we see the most is the lack of knowledge of how to communicate 
let's face it, some of us were never taught about it. I mean, how do I ask for something that I need or want? And maybe I was always told, go away. So I really suggest being slow, communicating, and seeking support around it as to set the boundaries. What do we do? Are we holding hands? You know, are we engaging sexually with one another? What does that look like? And always check with one another how they truly are feeling and what's going on. Yeah, um, reintegrating sex, it's not an on-off light switch. You know, right. you flip it and everything's, you know, bright and sunny. It's more like a dimmer switch, you know, a little bit at a time. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Dr. Rob always, well, first of all, there's a great blog. It's called partnerhope.com. Um, it's written by a woman named Michelle Mays. She's a therapist out in the D.C. area. And she deals with a lot of this issue from both the addict side and the partner side. She's got some wonderful blogs on this stuff. Mm -hmm. So uh, partnerhope.com. Um, so check that out. Um, Dr. Rob, in his writing, um, kind of echoes what Michelle um, the, the author of the Partner Hub blog says, which is reintegrate really slowly and start with non-sexual stuff. Don't plan on having sex. Um, you know, start with holding hands, you know, maybe a little massage or, you know, foot massage or just a walk together, or, you know, mm -hmm. sitting across from each other and looking into each other's eyes and sharing a sexual fantasy without actually planning to have sex. Um, and, and the time will eventually be right when both partners are ready. And sometimes it's, it's the addict partner who's not ready for sex. Right. When the betrayed partner is, and sometimes it's the betrayed partner who's not ready. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the emotional intimacy, sex is, should be, good sex is an emotionally intimate act. Um, sex addiction mm -hmm. sex is not. Um, sex addiction sex is the opposite of emotional intimacy. We use it to escape and numb out. So there's a lot of work for the addict to do on that. And the betrayed partner, you know, uh, has to find a way to feel a comfort level and to, to want to be sexual with this person who has really betrayed them. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, slow, slow, slow. Slow go, yeah. Um, next question here. Uh, hello, I recently found out that my uh, sex addict has had a child with one of his affairs partners. Um, how do I handle this situation? He doesn't want anything to do with the child and professes that he wants to stay with me. Um, we're not married and have no children or dependencies. Am I stupid for even considering staying? There's a lot packed into that. There's a lot packed into that. Um, I think my first thought would be is for whoever's asking the question, if you're uncertain how you feel, then there may be uncertainty in the relationship. So I would definitely be working with a therapist of some type to really pull that, that knot apart to see what's in there and to really determine what you feel. And then with the couples, a couple session and um, that type of work is to really understand how does that look how will that look in your relationship and be extremely honest with one another. It's not one to, to try to just get past it or to appease one another, but you're talking, you're talking a child. So you can't get around that part of it, but to really seek some support on that, that's a very difficult um, situation to be in. And I totally support you really seeking out for yourself to really determine how you feel about it inside versus it's not how I fix it, but how do I feel about it? And how can I move forward with this or can I not? So I wish you, I wish you well on that, but please seek support. Um, you've got a lot to talk about and a lot of things to think about that goes with that. Um, I just want to address the, the last bit of that question. Um, am, I, am I stupid for even considering staying? No, of course you're no. not. No. Um, love is love. We, you know, we love who we love. And, you know, that's the way it is. And, you know, things like this can be worked through. Mm -hmm. um, they're not always worked through, but they certainly can be. Um, 
So if you want the relationship to work out, then do what you can to make it work out. Mm -hmm. um, but stay true to yourself and, and know what you're really feeling and what you're really wanting. Um, right. And, you know, understand why you're making the decisions that you're, that you're making. Mm -hmm. you're so. um, next one. <coughs> Um, my husband uh, had a 20-year porn addiction and then had, uh, within the last year, an emotional affair. Um, this time I found two hookup sites on his phone. Um, although he claims that the thought of sex never crossed his mind uh, with the woman he had the affair with, the emotional affair with, um, and he said he was just curious about the hookup sites but would never have sex any with anyone. I have a hard time believing um, this. <laughs> Um, so uh, let me repeat back to you, Scott. Part of the question is spouse has had a long time addiction with porn. Yeah. He's been on online site has stated that he has had hookup sites. Good, good word to add in there and has stated that he's only had an emotional affair with someone. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So let's she's go on. Believing this. I, I can understand. I mean, all the past history is there. Now, I will give it this. I have seen people that that, is, that can be a progression of their sexual behavior, that it goes from porn to hookup sites, but never really hooked up, is what I'm hearing. And I only had an emotional affair. So I have heard of um, I'd I would want to make sure that truth is, is told. But I do want to say this. Um, many times what I find is that the emotional affair on the betrayed spouse or partner is much more difficult to move past. Because as I will say, as a being a female, females are very relational. So if I may be able to work through a spouse or partner cheating on me sexually, now that's that's working through it, okay, um, and get to a plus. But the emotional thing, usually with the very first thing I hear is, did you love her? Did you love him? Because it makes a big difference because of the, the relational component is loving somebody and sharing the, the secrets that you have, um, the fears that you have, that's that intimate piece that goes into a real relationship is not having fear to do that. So um, I, I see much, a much harder time for somebody to turn around when there really is truly an emotional affair and that there has not been any sexual contact. Though I think what Scott and I are both saying is that's a long time to be on dating app sites and, and not challenging anybody here, but that is something that really needs to be looked at carefully for the addict to really see what's going on. I think the addict also needs to understand that it's, it's still cheating. Um, you know, yeah. Dr. Rob's definition of cheating is keeping important sexual romantic or romantic secrets from your primary romantic partner. Mm -hmm. If I'm keeping a secret from my primary romantic partner about my sex or, or, or romantic behavior, I'm cheating. Right. Uh, it doesn't matter what I'm doing. Um, and, and they've done, Rob and, and other people have done studies um, showing it doesn't matter what the behavior is. It hurts the same. The betrayal feels the same. And what hurts the most is the loss of trust. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's rarely a specific sexual behavior. It hurts the most. It's the loss of trust. I can't trust anything you say to me anymore. Of course you're questioning him. Um, he has betrayed you. So, and, and there were probably a lot of lies and secrets along the way. It's, it's going to be very hard for you to trust. Uh, anything he says for quite a while, he's going to have to re-earn your trust. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and feel free to point out to him that, you know, the fact that sex never crossed your mind, you were having an emotional affair. That's cheating. Exactly. Um, Rob's book, Out of the Doghouse. Give it to him. Throw it at him. Uh, <laughs> you know, make him read it. Um, because I, I, it sounds like he's not getting the pain that he has caused you with his behaviors. Um, he thinks he didn't cheat. 
but you know, I'm, I'm reading into this, but you know, I, I've, <laughs> I've been to enough 12 step meetings. I've had enough sponsees. I've sat in on enough therapy groups to know that this, this sounds really familiar. You know, as Karen said, you know, we hear this and, all the time. And one of the biggest points that Scott brought out before is in a true intimate relationship, it is about sharing in here. It is about sharing our most intimate questions, our feelings, or the secrets that we've held, the fears that we have. That's what really creates that intimacy. It's not the sexual component. That's, that's an add-on because we're sexual beings, but it's sharing the inside of us. One day sex may go away. We may get older. Something may happen. Are you still an intimate couple with sharing who you are. Is this really your best friend that you can say anything to and count on? So beyond committed relationship is cheating. And it may be lies of omission is what we call it. Oh yeah, you didn't have sex, but you forgot to tell me. Would you would you talk to this person in the same way if I was standing there as your spouse? That's always something to ask is, well, let me just be there you know how are you talking to this person why am i not involved with it so um i agree with scott with what he said. yeah yeah um I, I use that one with my sponsees all the time i, I have a sponsee he's he's a medical doctor he's a super high powered guy and we have dinner once a week and do our, our regular meeting and uh one week there was an attractive waitress and um he's like oh you're doing such a great job what's your name and, and as soon as she left, I said, first of all, if that was a male waitress, would you have said any of that? And second of all, if your wife was here, would you have said any of that? And he just <laughs> kind of sat there for a minute. He's like, I need to recalibrate my, my thinking about what's up. Here. Yeah. And I, have, I guess you do. Um, you know, um, I love this next question, actually. We're getting good questions today. Thank you, everybody. Um, I have been sober for three years, except once a week with porn. Um, that's like drinking while I'm in AA, right? Very interesting <laughs> question, and there's a lot of layers to the answer. Right. So I've been sober, and what is your commitment to sobriety? Bingo. You know, is um, when, when you're in recovery, is commitment abstinence of? Are you using porn... Um, with compulsive masturbation for six hours, one day a week. You know, there's a, lot of, there's a lot more layers to that description as to what's going on. But when you're committing to sobriety, you're committing to sobriety. And that doesn't give you leeway or to find loopholes because that only one day a week, just like drinking, just like anything else, is going to escalate and can escalate. Don't know when, don't know what you know, how long, but it will escalate to, oh, it's just two days a week, or I'm only, I just drink on the weekend, that type of thing. And um, yeah, it's uh, many layers with that. And I believe that's, that's what we call one of those slippery slopes that you have to be careful and you need to be honest with your, um, your sponsor if you have one because you're in recovery and hopefully you do and be honest with what's going on and uh, with your peer support group that you have so that they also give you feedback as to what they know and if they've seen any other behaviors that are showing up that they haven't seen since you've just gone to it once a week. And I'd love to know what kind of porn you're looking at. That can make a big difference as well. Yeah, I would also add that, um, you know, sex addiction sobriety and is different than alcohol sobriety. Um, sex addiction mm -hmm. is much more like an eating disorder where you try and eliminate the behaviors that are problematic and then you can engage in the behaviors in moderation that aren't problematic um and you know aa you just don't drink na you just don't use you know gambling you just stay the hell out of the casino <laughs> um you just you don't even go there for dinner um <laughs> But um, you know, in sex addiction recovery, we create um, circle plans. Um, and I don't know if you have one, you've been sober for three years, but that doesn't mean you necessarily have a plan. Um, the inner circle is the bottom line behaviors, the behaviors that are ruining your life. Um, 
if you if you engage in a bottom line behavior, you're not sober. Your right. middle boundary or your middle circle is slippery behaviors. Um, driving through certain neighborhoods, talking to certain people, you know, having a cocktail after work on the way home. You know, those are slippery, um, but they're probably not bottom line sexual behaviors. And then your your outer circle, outer boundary is um, healthy things that you can do instead of engaging in your addiction. Um, you know, hanging out with your family, you know, going camping with your buddies, um, you know, exercising at the gym, you know, whatever. Um, so I don't know where porn would fall for you in your plan. Um, mm -hmm. If porn was never part of your addiction and you have no other sexual life, if you're single, not dating, you know, maybe looking once a week at porn is okay. I'm not trying to justify this for you. Um, most sex addicts have porn in the middle circle or in the inner, inner, inner boundary. It is a right. bottom line behavior for most people. And if it starts out in the middle boundary, it generally gets moved <laughs> to the inner boundary and becomes a bottom line behavior because people will become compulsive with it. And I can tell you that is my personal experience. When I first started in recovery, porn was a, a middle boundary behavior. It wasn't one of my bottom line behaviors. But when I removed all the bottom line behaviors, it became a bottom line behavior. So be very, very, very careful with that. Um, like Karen said, it's, almost, it's almost like what we talked about with cross addiction. It's, well, it really wasn't a big deal or anything important, but now that I've stopped doing the things that were really causing me a problem, this one came up and become a problem that leads you back into some of your bottom line behaviors. So that... Yeah, and, re and remember what addiction is about. It's about escape. I was talking with Tim Stein, who's a, a therapist up in Santa Rosa, um, this morning, and we were talking about what, what he called not porn, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I laughed and I said, you mean car porn and vacation porn? And, and he said, yeah, it, because it's another, I can go, you know, and Karen kind of mentioned it earlier. I can go online and, you know, the, the, the automobile makers, you can build your own car and your dream car. I can do that for hours. And mm -hmm. I'm using it the same way I use porn. And I have to recognize that that is not a healthy behavior for me. Right. Um, so I don't know how you're, you're using porn. And if you're on for five minutes, get on, get off, get off. Um, or, you know, if you're spending six hours once a week, I, it, it's something that definitely, as Karen said, needs to be discussed with your sponsor, mm -hmm. your support network, your therapist, um, et cetera. Um, Agreed. Super interesting question. Um, this is a follow-up. Um, to the one about um, re-engaging sexually um, with the sex addiction partner. Um, how does the sexually addicted partner turn it back on without turning it all back on? I would say that they're ready to move into, if they're asking that question, and they were cheating um, on their spouse and acting out, then they still need to do some more work around the whole process of, of what recovery is and what, what are their real behaviors right now? Because that's, that's an unusual question. If, if I'm in recovery and I have done my work and I'm doing my work, then like we discussed earlier, it's a slow moving process to reconnect or re-engage sexually with the person that you love, your partner, your spouse, whoever that is. If you have fears of, well, that caused me to run out and act, and then I really believe you need to look more at what was your cause of acting out. Is what was what was the thing that had you keep escaping um, to find out how that could move you back into your addiction? Um, and again, it's got to be that being very honest. The the honesty is one of the most important things in recovery. The honesty and the integrity, but um, that's a really tough question. Um, hopefully that, you know, if, if it works out well for you, then the person that you're having sex with and all of that is not somebody you have to act out with, that you're being honest and sincere and you connect, reconnect with that person in a healthier way. Yeah, I think this question may be coming from the betrayed partner who's worried mm -hmm. about the addict. Oh, right. Um, but, but 
It's difficult for the addict, um, but again, you know, this is, I'll use the, the, the eating disorder analogy again. Um, nobody wants to spend the rest of their life not eating. Um, if they do, they're not going to have a very long life, and nobody wants to spend the rest of their life, particularly in a relationship, um, without ever being sexual with their partner again. Um, so it's a slow, gradual process, and uh, like we talked about earlier, I think reintegrating emotional intimacy first and then non-sexual physical intimacy next and mm -hmm. and um you know and and getting some you know the addict needs to get some sobriety under his belt or her belt um really well one of, one, of the, one of the things we add um scott one of the what the psych ed type thing that that we always bring into play um bring it into play with your sponsees and different things is a lot of people just don't understand because they've never been taught how how can I be intimate with my partner or spouse and not be sexual? You know, if I've grown up and at 13 years old have sex or had anything going on, then intimacy means having sex. And what we say is intensity, which is sexual acting out, is what people use and they think it's intimacy so um i think that's the key to that is really understanding what that is and looking at that it's a very different process we are sexual beings those little naked babies are born to be picked up and held and they stop crying and I'm grateful that we are sexual beings i mean that's just who we are that's part of part of our DNA and but it has to be in a healthy way for both people not just for one yeah it's um I'll tell you a little of my story um I'm a sex addict um I had a house a home life that looked good uh if you can tell you you know we're in the house behind closed doors and then it was really dysfunctional. And um, I learned very early on that a way for me to escape was to go into my room, shut the door, and masturbate. Um, mm -hmm. I used sex right from the start to do the opposite of connecting. Mm -hmm. um, I used it to avoid other people, to avoid having to deal with other people. Um, and it became very compartmentalized. Um, you know, sex was here, people with thoughts and feelings and emotions, and, and you know, they were over here. Um, and it, it, it's very, very, very difficult for someone like me, and I'm, I'm guessing your partner, um, to integrate those two things. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's why we're talking so much about going slow, working on, you know, feeling it in your heart, not in your genitals, um, you know, right. first. And, and that's what the addict has to learn how to do. And it's going to happen imperfectly. Um, mm -hmm. So as a betrayed partner, if you are open to getting your sexual needs met um, and letting uh, your, your addicted partner learn as he goes, um, you know, I, th I think you can do it and I think you can learn mm -hmm. together and, and grow closer than ever um, through that process. I mean, it's, you know, learning something together is, is a really intimate act, I, I think. Mm -hmm. To add on, I have heard many times people that have been married for a long time and once they go through this and they've done their work and, and they're moving in their life, it's still touch and go, but they're moving on, is many times they'll come back and say, I have never felt this good in my marriage. I don't think we really had a marriage before because we were not connected emotionally, though I thought we were. And that's, you know, what you learn is we, we all think we've got it, but unless we've really experienced it, then all we know is what we think we know or what we've seen before. So I know that's confusing what I'm saying, but um, 
it it really rang true when I could see the total difference in a couple where they were talking and sharing and it was that was real that was two human beings that were really engaged with one another and I think that's what ultimately has to happen um, and the sexual component doesn't have to go away but you have to be connected before you connect sexually yeah I, I, I agree um, all right we've got um, one more here this is another follow-up um, this is about um, the emotional affair um, the emotional affair partner was long distance living in another state um, it went on for nine months um, he planned two trips to go see her um, he had acquired feelings for her and referred to her as his girlfriend um, I think if you call someone your girlfriend um, uh, I am guessing that that word is meant to be infidelity has crossed your mind. Um, thoughts on that? Um, first of all, the word girlfriend means a lot more to me than um, I'm just sharing my soul with somebody else. Um, if you're in a committed relationship or you're in a marriage with one another, then there is no room for someone called a girlfriend. Okay just think of the terms of that. Um, but it's, uh, I, I, you know, I can't cast a decision on someone that I don't know, but even to use those terms imp can imply something more. Um, you can't have a girlfriend and a wife or a partner at the same time. Again, there's lying and there's cheating going on by the behaviors and the secrets. If you didn't know that your husband was going to another city, our partner was going to another city to meet up with his girlfriend, then that was the secret that was being kept. And that's where infidelities start. It's with what's not said, not necessarily the action. And I think that's, we sort of talked about that before. Is yeah. that- uh, Yeah, and you know, there's, there's no rule that says people have to be monogamous, but- Right. You need to agree. You know, if he wants to have an open relationship, he has to run that past you. Yeah. Um, and you have to agree without any kind of coercion. And it's clear that he didn't run it past you. And if he had tried to, you would not have agreed. So, right. Yeah, this is just, it's just cheating. Um, yeah, I think, I think it stands on its own. And there's probably um, some work that, that someone needs to, needs to do on trying to rationalize behavior such as that. But again, I do agree with you. If it's two grown consenting adults and you decide that you want your life sexually to be a certain way and you're both in agreement, that's your choice. Um, if you're in a relationship, but that means you can have sex outside of your relationship and you both agree, then that's y'all's choice together. But yeah, I agree, obviously, that wasn't a decision that was made together. Yeah, and there, there are plenty of relationships that I know of where, you know, looking at porn once in a while is okay, or, you know, getting a massage mm -hmm. when you're out of town on business is okay, as long as you don't keep secrets about it, as long as you don't fall in love with, so, you know, there, there, are, there are boundaries that are mutually agreed upon, um, and always one of the boundaries for a relationship like that to work is no secrets. Um, right. And Scott, one of the things we, we hear all the time is the question will be asked is, is it okay if I look at porn with my partner or spouse? Well, if you both agree that that's, that's not um, an inner, a center circle behavior that um, the partner or spouse has, then again, you're consenting adults, but you both have to consent to doing that. And, you know, it's no judgment on what two adults decide to do together. But in the case of sex addiction, a betrayed partner would need to understand that, you know, if, if looking at porn together has been an enjoyable part of their sex life, but he was also looking at porn or she, the addict was also right. looking at porn as an integral part of the addiction, um, right. Putting a point together might be a problem, and they may need to rethink um, that aspect of their sex life and find something else that, that they enjoy. Exactly. Exactly. Um, 
and there's a whole lot of things you can do uh, in your sex life that, that can be enjoyable. So, yeah. uh -huh. so um, yeah. we are pretty well out of time. Karen, do you want to say anything to um, wrap us up and take us out? Um, I just want to say thank you first for, um, um, for letting me be here and be a part of this. I think this is an amazing webinar and hopefully supportive. Um, if anyone has any questions or concerns or things like that, just make sure you reach out and talk to your therapist, your loved one, send in a question, do things like that. Um, you're not alone. No matter who you are, whether you're the addict or whether you are the, the traumatized spouse or partner, you do not have to live through this alone. Um, I know it's hard to tell other people or to reach out for help, but the only way through this is is to walk it through with someone that can help you or a group of people that can and i promise you that road is a heck of a lot easier if you're not trying to do it alone thank you karen um i do want to add um this group will not meet next week um it's okay. thanksgiving evening so david and i are taking a, a night off um so we'll see everybody in two weeks um, and I think, Karen, you might be back in two weeks because David's traveling again. Yeah. So um, I think, I, think I, I probably will. So that doesn't mean y'all don't show up, okay? Yeah. Um, <laughs> but anyway, just show up with it, and hopefully everyone has a very safe and happy uh, Thanksgiving. And if you're going through anything, seek out some friends to be with. Do not be alone, okay? Take, Take care, care everyone. Right. We'll see you in a couple Bye. weeks. Bye. Night, Karen. We'll see you later. Bye.